acceptable as the only sacrifice for all sin. Blood would never be shed again because the blood shed on Calvary was sufficient. <coughs> but religion today has become a term that encompasses all things. And we need to be careful. What kind of religion do you have today? If you had to describe your religion, how would you describe it today? Is your religion like a spare tire? Is your religion something that you only use in case of an emergency? When the upsets of life put you on the side of the road? When you are, are headed somewhere but you have the unexpected happen and you can't go no more? Do you pull over and, and access your religion of spare tires? Maybe your religion today is, is more like a, a, a wheelbarrow. Maybe it's easily upset, but it, it's hard to push. Or maybe you're easily upset or you have to be pushed. The only thing you do in religion is when somebody else comes along and picks you up and drives you forward. And the only time you spill something out for the cause of Christ is when somebody tips you up and, and dumps you out. Is that your religion? Maybe your religion is like a bus. Maybe your religion today is like a bus and that you only get on it when it goes your way. You only get on it when it's convenient for you and it's going the direction that you desire to go. Tracy, we talked about it this morning. Maybe your religion's like Brother Harold Lyman. Maybe you're just always walking. You're always looking. You're always talking. And you're always willing to just go with the flow. That may not be the context of our conversation this morning, but I wanted to go ahead and throw that in here. I love Brother Harold. I love him. I love talking to him. I love seeing him. I know it pains the family to see him out there in 100 degree weather walking up and down the road. But he's smiling. He's waving. He's talking. He's willing to get in the car and to talk to you. To ride to town with you. That really ought to be like our religion. God, can we just be walking for you? God, can we just be talking for you? God, can we just be willing to to get on this, this mode of transportation whether it, it don't have to be a bus it don't have to be going where I want it to go when I want it to go with the convenience of the pickup where I want it to be God I don't want my religion to be like a wheelbarrow where somebody else has to pick me up and, and struggle to push me forward and then they have to dump me out God help us don't let our religion be like a spare tire that we only turn to when we find ourselves Whatever the kind of religion you have today, I want you to look beyond where you're at right now. I say this a lot. You're going to hear this as long as you have me around. Uh, where we're at right now only matters right now. Because God's love and God's payment and God's grace and God's mercy is enough to take us where we need to be no matter where we're at right now. Don't dwell where you're at right now. Just recognize. Hear the conviction that God may be laying out before you and say, okay, that's where I'm at. God, how can you get me where you want me to be? But whatever kind of religion you may have right now, spare child, wheelbarrow, bus religion, brother Wayne uh, religion, however we describe it, wherever you're at right now, it is of no value unless it is pleasing to God in heaven. Unless it's bringing honor to God and glory to God, unless it's praising Him and magnifying Him, no matter what we're doing right now, has zero value if it's not doing those things. It don't matter how big the church is. 
It don't matter how much money the church has. It don't how much money we give to other people. It don't matter how many fellowships we have. It don't matter how many singers we have. It don't matter how many different Bible studies we have. If all of the above don't honor God and glorify God, it is useless. In James chapter 1 and 26 and 27, we find a definition of what constitutes pure and undefiled religion before God. It allows us to see and it allows us to examine and to be sure that our religion is acceptable before God. It shows us some attributes of, of pure and undivided religion that is important for us to have in our lives. Chapter 1 of the book of James, verse 26 to 27. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is in vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. To visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. To visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. God has given us a New Testament definition of what good religion should be. You know where we see a, 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 a parallel? You know where you're going to see another passage that's Old Testament in nature that, that may not use exactly those words, but they go hand in hand? In the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh, today we, we've, uh, we've identified Sodom and Gomorrah as being God bringing down fire and brimstone in heaven and wiping out that town because they were homosexuals. Now the Bible gives us indication that's true, but in Ezekiel, we see that it was a whole lot more than that. It was their unwillingness to serve others. It was their unwillingness to help others. And it was all of these things that are, is really close to this definition of religion. Pure and undefiled religion is to visit the fatherless, to visit the widows in their affliction, and to keep yourself unspotted from the world. It's important as we examine this and as we consider this today that we understand that our relationship between us and God is all that matters. We can't look at other people. We can't, we can't begin to, to fight the, the, the spiritual battle of other people when we have a spiritual battle right here in our life that we must deal with. We can help each other. We can support each other. We can love each other. We can... Be there for each other. And all those things God has called the church to do. But we have to be careful. So what are some tenets that we can pull from this so that we can better our worship, so that we can better our understanding of our religion today? First, I want to tell you that, that a, a God-based religion is a practicing religion. It's a practicing religion. If your religion does not require you to do something for God, you're missing out on it. And there's something that's not complete. Because God requires us to practice our religion. He, he wants us to live it out. He, he, he wants us. We, we see that when you look at the original wording and, and, and we see it in the phraseology of verse number 27, to visit. To visit. It's not enough for us to gather together and say, 
oh, we need to pray for so-and-so who's fatherless, or oh, we need to just pray for these widows that are... No, it's to visit them. It's to go. It's to be there. It's to support. It's to actively practice what God has called us to do. The context of this verse makes it clear that we must be doers. 1 John chapter 1, 22 and 25. It tells us there that we should be doers of the word, not hearers only. There's a, it, it's really easy today to hear the word of God. I don't want to discourage anybody, but you don't have to go to a church building and a worship service to hear the Word of God. You can look it up on your phone. You can, you can search it on YouTube. You can hear the Word of God anywhere and everywhere. And God can speak to you through things that's not even His Word. But pure religion and undefiled religion is not just hearing the Word of God, it is doing it. It is practicing it. It is being active in it. I like, it, I, I like an illustration that was shared with me several years ago. And it was shared with me when I was working on the helicopter. And, and we were waiting on a, a patient to be ready for transfer and I was talking to a receiving doctor at another facility, and I was letting him know what the client was showing and what we were seeing on our monitors. And he was joking with me. He wasn't a neurosurgeon. They don't joke. They have dry personalities. But this doctor said, tell him not to worry. I've been a doctor since 1972, but I've not been practicing the last 20 years. And we laughed. He was joking. But the truth is, would you go see a doctor? Would you go allow a surgeon? I don't want to know if I need to stay here for the course of getting in the microphone so they can hear me. Would you go see a surgeon that hasn't been practicing in the field for the last given period of time? No, you wouldn't. Why? Because they've been discontinued from the modernization of medicine, from the advancements, from the new drugs, from the new procedures, from the new treatments, from the, the, the new evidence of, of procedures that's come out. Sure, they're a doctor, but they're not going to operate on you. And, and the truth is, it's important for us to practice our religion and practice our Christianity because that's how God ministers to us. That's how God reveals to us, and that's how God talks to us, and that's how God opens doors for us. And we're able to serve others in a greater capacity because we're not just hearing His Word, we're doing His Word. And we're practicing it. It echoes the teachings of Jesus Himself. Jesus didn't just sit up on the mountain and, and, and project out the Word and tell them to go do it. No, he, he taught them. And even in that day, he often taught them in, in parables. He would put the message there, and he would even allow them maybe to not even understand that message until they continued to follow him and they saw what he'd done. And they witnessed his actions. If we are not doers, we are deceiving ourselves. James 1, 22. It, it not only says, don't be a, a hearer of the word, but be a doer, but it says, those of you that hear only, you're deceiving yourself. Pure religion, undefiled religion, it is practicing what God is talking to you about, practicing what God has called you to do. It requires action on your part, and if you're not going to do that, you are simply deceiving yourself. You're not deceiving God. God's all known. God's not taken back. God's not surprised at anything. You're not even deceiving Satan. He knows the truth. 
I like another meme I've seen over the last couple of weeks. Satan's a believer, but he's not a child of God. If you're willing to, to come and you're willing to study and you're willing to hear and, and you're willing to, to know that God is talking to you but you're not willing to do what God is asking you to do, you're deceiving yourself. And you're not living pure and undefiled religion. Practicing your religion must be important. A church that does not actively practice what they believe is a dead church. I'm going to say that again. A church that does not actively practice what they believe is a dead church. Might as well just put a coffin up here. Might as well just have an eulogy that's read talking about all the great things that happened. But if a church today is not willing to practice what God has called them to do as a corporate body of believers, we're dead. Don't be deceived. God has got something for us to do. Pure and undefiled religion is not just a practicing religion. Pure and undefiled religion is a, is a very practical religion. What do you mean, Pastor? What do you mean when you say practical? Well, let me give you a couple examples. God did not intend for our religion to consist solely of our presence in a worship service. If you think that me or any other pastor on the face of the earth, I, I would view myself in the, in the bottom percentile of, of the greatness of earthly pastors. And I don't care who the pastor is, if you think that that person can provide you pure religion in an hour and 15 minute worship service, you are missing the point. All we can do here if you have the greatest earthly pastor that's ever walked, and you don't, but if you did, if you had the greatest music minister, the greatest piano player, the greatest organist, the greatest teacher, the greatest technological advancement, the greatest of everything, if you think pure religion can be defined in an hour to an hour and a half worship service, you're deceived. That's not practical. And that's not what God has called for us to do. We must extend our heart to God in worship in every aspect of our life. I look forward to coming here with you. I look forward to singing. I look forward to lifting my voice in praise. I look forward to communicating with you all. But I'll be honest with you, the most moving song service I'm ever a part of is usually in a shower at 6.15 in the morning. It's usually in my car driving to work. Why? Because I don't care what I sound like. You ought to hear some of the notes that I pull off from the dog. They would immediately get me fired, cut off from any musical avenue. But I worship. I'm praising. Me and God laugh about it. And then I'll try it again. And he'll say, no, not that one either. <laughs> Do it again. And we continue to go in that. You see, that's the practicality of the religion that God desires for us to have. We should come here. We should worship together. We should laugh together. We should cry together. We should pray together. We, we should support each other. We should comfort each other. We, we should, you know, in love, give some correction for each other. 
And we should build on each other. But our religion is not based on that very little given moment in time. I can't give you pure religion, pure religion by leading an hour and a half worship. <coughs> Let me also say this. I can't give you pure religion by leading an hour and a half worship today and an hour tonight and an hour on Wednesday. Three and a half hours won't cut it either. There's 168 hours in a week. And, and, and pure religion is for us to be so in tune with God is that when we even go to sleep that God even puts sweet dreams in our night. If He don't do it, it's okay. But that's where we should get to. Impure and undefiled religion. Extending our hand to man in service. Extending our hearts to each other and to God. It is so much more than we will ever do in a moment of time called the worship service. It literally requires our life in sacrifice and dedication of our actions. Day in and day out. Throughout the New Testament, there's a lot of emphasis that's placed on, on, on doing good things. Paul, he wrote much of the New Testament. He, he talks about good works and he encourages good works. And there's no doubt that, that God has in the plans of all believers the, the activity of good works. We're called to serve each other. We're called to minister to each other. Hebrews, uh, the book of faith, it, it talks about the, the brotherly love that should come from the church. The Apostle John We have to allow religion to be practical. It's got to be something that we do. It's got to be something that we believe. It's got to be something that we breathe. It's got to be something that, that literally sweats out of us as we work for Christ on this earth. And until we begin to apply the Word of God to our lives and show kindness and show compassion for the poor, for the helpless, for the needy. And until we begin to, to love, to preach and teach the Word outside of a given moment of time, outside of a, a given worship service, until we apply the Word of God by studying it into our life every day and every aspect, God's Word and how it affects us, we're going to struggle with having a practical religion. Our religion should be a practicing religion. Our religion should be a practical religion. Our religion should be a personal religion. When you look at the text, when you look at James, and you go back to verse 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, look here, 23. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he not them. We're going, to, we're going to look at pronouns here, not in the way that the world looks at pronouns. We're going to look at the individuality, the singularity that is pointed out in this passage. He. Some, some versions say anyone. That's singular as well. Himself. You'll see in verse number 24. His way. He was. Verse number 25. He, this one. Anyone. Verse 26. He, his, this one. Verse 27. Oneself. You see, religion is a very personal thing. We, we tend in our culture today to say, well, you have that Southern Baptist religion. You have that Independent Baptist religion. You have that United Methodist religion. You have that Church of Christ religion. You have that PCBB, PBB, whatever numbers we can put on it religion. You got Christ or you don't, folks. You know the blood of Jesus Christ or you don't. You're worshiping Him or you're worshiping man. 
You can't serve God and mammon, the Bible says. Yes, there's a place for corporate giving. Yes, there's a place for corporate worship. God has called us to come together. And God has called us to, to meet. And God has called us to assemble. But our religion is so much more than we can express here in a given period of time. I'll quit saying that. I'll quit harping on that. But I want you to know that religion does not take place here on Sunday morning. Religion does not take place on Sunday night, Wednesday night. Religion takes place from the time you accept Christ as your Savior till the time that religion ends for you and you go home to your eternal heavenly home with a new body, face to face with Jesus Christ. <coughs> Religion was never intended to, to replace our, our personal and our individual responsibility. Some people think that, that, that they, they teach Sunday school in the name of religion. Some people think that they serve as, as deacons or preachers or, or music ministers in the name of religion. No, that's just us acting out a gift that God has given us. You're giving on Sunday. You're giving in a worship service. It, 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 it don't fulfill the responsibility of pure and undefiled religion, does it? What are we doing here this morning that is reaching out to the homeless? What are we doing here this morning that is reaching out to the fatherless, that's reaching out to the widow? Not just reaching out, but visiting them. I hope we are doing something this morning to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. And I hope we allow any time the Word of God is preached, read, taught, sown before us to, to come into our hearts and allow the convicting power of the Holy Spirit to speak to us so that our life will be changed, so that we can repent, and so that we can be different. I hope we are doing that. But we have an individual responsibility God expects us to do these things. We must make it personal. Don't worry about what your preacher thinks. Don't worry about what your Sunday school teacher thinks. Don't worry about what brother and sister so-and-so across the aisle thinks. Just examine your service and examine it between you and God. <laughs> and if you think God's happy, march on. And if you think God is, is, is wanting some more or wanting something different, I encourage you to simply repent and give it to Him and allow Him to lead you on a personal level. And do that. It's a personal religion. Using the Word of God in the passage that we have, I can't help but say it better be a pure religion. Our religion should be a practicing religion. Our religion should be practical. It should be personal. But folks, it should be a pure religion. Does that mean we're going to be perfect? Absolutely not. We're going to fall short. We're, we're going to give in to the flesh from time to time. I don't say this to, to, to magnify it. I don't say this to allow us to, to think it's okay. But the truth is live in the flesh. And Satan is real. But God is real too. And if we make a bad decision, and if we begin to go down the wrong road, God is still there. And if you're saved and you know Christ is your Savior, the Holy Spirit dwells within you. Let Him have His way. Don't fight against Him. This sounds redundant, but in the day that we live, it must be emphasized. Our society has become increasingly immoral. Our society has come to a place that, that they are extremely materialistic in nature. It's not the same world it was when I grew up in. And newsflash, it's not going to be the same world next month that it is now. And I believe that things 
have the potential to get much, much, much worse. But God is still God. And God is still on His throne. And society today is wrecking havoc upon many people in God's church. And society is wreaking havoc on, on churches as a congregation. I don't know if what we're seeing now is just the tip of the iceberg or if it's more toward the base. It don't matter. Because God has called us to be pure. God has called us to be undefiled. What do those two words mean? Pure means essentially unblemished. Undefiled means untainted. If you look those words up, unblemished and untainted, that, that, means that, that means we better be very vigilant, church. We need to guard ourselves. We need to use caution. I'm not giving a message of hate, and I, and I hope it's not taken in that by any means, because there's a lot of people today that are living outside of what we believe. There's a lot of people today that, that are living under the premise of what the world says is okay and not what God says is okay. And, and I want you to hear this message from me right now. If, if there's somebody living with a, a sin in their life, if there's somebody that's, that's living with a level of immorality in their life, I love them. And we as a church better love them. Why? Because we're sinners too. And sin is sin. But God has called us to examine our life and to live under the premise of God's Word. All people are welcome here. All walks of life, all lifestyles are welcome here at this church. And I believe, and I believe that you've seen proof over the years uh, of all the different lifestyles that come in. I, I am pleased to say that this church accepts those people. We worship with them. We don't judge them. We don't call them out. We don't separate them. Praise God, we stand for the truth. And unfortunately, if they don't agree with the truth of the Word of God, they're going to hear something that's not in line with their life. But I hope and I pray that they are hearing it in love, not in judgment. Because I just want for God to work in their life the way He's worked in mine. But for me, I have to constantly check up on myself. I have to look at my heart, and I have to look at my thoughts, and I have to look at my actions, and I have to look at my thoughts, and I have to look at my words and my deeds. And God has called me to remain pure and unblemished. God has called me to be untainted. Guess what? I'm not capable of that. I've confessed one of my sins I struggled with this morning. And I'll tell you, if I was honest throughout the week, there would be more. And I know you struggle with it too. We're not capable of that in ourselves. But we can do all things through Christ Jesus which strengthens us. And if you will search Him, if you will seek Him, if you will surrender to Him, if you will fall on your face before Him, by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, we can be sinners, but we can remain pure. We can be undefiled. We can be unspotted because of His blood. His blood will cleanse us. His blood will make us pure if we will walk in the light of Jesus Christ. This often involves us keeping His precepts, keeping His word, keeping His commandments. And the more we keep them, and the more we study, the more we'll understand them, and the more they'll be real to us. 
and the more we'll accept them. I think back to my military days. There's probably no other aspect of my life. I, I was raised, I'll say fairly strict, but nothing compared to Uncle Sam. Uncle Sam told you when to brush your hair, and you didn't have an option to part it because you brushed it even though there wasn't no hair there. And you wore socks. <coughs> and they were green. It didn't matter what you matched with it, you wore green socks. And when I went to basic, I couldn't understand why we had to number our socks. One, two, three, four, five, six, that was our two. They issued you seven pairs. And every morning we had to we had to find the sock order. Because the drill started the day before would hide. And it would be sock number two and number six. And then it would tell you which one went on the left foot, which one went on the right foot. And later on, he would require everybody to sit down on their back and raise their legs up. And they would come around and take their shoes off. And you better have number two on the left foot and number six on the right. And it's almost like every inch of my life for those, those 14 weeks was so structured. Oh, I hated it. Day one was miserable. Day two was even worse. But you know what? The more that I've done that and the more that i followed those commandments, the more I began to enjoy it. And, and before I know it, uh, I was graduated from basic training and, and I was being issued new uniforms on my own and I was writing numbers on my socks. <laughs> and the truth is, Christian, God's Word is not going to be pleasant to us. And God's Word is not going to be popular to us living in the world that we live. But the more we follow His commandments and the more we do what He's commanded us to do, the easier it will be to fulfill. And before you know it, you'll walk with Him to the point that, that you will continue to stand and you will continue to do His precepts, you will continue to do His ministry, even when somebody's not holding your hand and forcing you to do it. And when you get to that place, you're going to find yourself with a religion that is practicing, with a religion that is practical, with a religion that is personal, with a religion that is pure. It's only possible by the help of God. What kind of religion do you have? Spare tire? Only there for emergencies. A wheelbarrow? A religion that is cumbersome to somebody else as they push you along. A bus? Only if it's going the direction you want it to go at a time that is convenient for you. Or do you have a religion that is practical, practicing, personal, and pure? Is it a practical religion? Does it go beyond the walls of this building? It should. Does it go beyond the printed pages of your Bible? It should. Does it go beyond a superficial hearing of the Word of God? Is it something that is wrapped up in your deeds and your actions? If you're a practicing Christian, it should go beyond all of those things. Is it a practical religion? Does your religion consist of just going to church, being present at a given service, or services? Does it go beyond just a daily Bible reading or, or prayer before a meal? If it is a practical religion, it should. Does it reach out and manifest itself to others as compassion and love and care? If your religion is practical, it will. Is it personal? Does it go beyond what we do in conjunction with each other at a scheduled service or a scheduled event? Your religion should. 
Does it include our personal involvement apart from what somebody else does? If your religion is practical and personal, it will. It will be between you and God. And if others are a part of it, hallelujah. And if others are not a part of it, it's still a call to hallelujah because God is leading you and working with you. It is as pure. Does your religion involve the initial cleansing of sin by the blood of Jesus Christ and by the blood of Him alone? By grace, through faith, have you confessed your sins and believed in Him? And now that you're saved, as you struggle, as the walks of life throw curveballs at you, are you still striving to maintain a purity in your walk with Christ? I hope you do. Does it include putting away a sin with the help of God so that we may truly be unblemished or unspotted by the world? I hope it does. I'll close with this. If you want to come, get ready to do our invitation time. I said this Wednesday night. Repentance is not a crying out. Repentance is a changing of. There's a lot of people that believe today that they've repented because they have cried out. They've been caught, they've been in struggles, they've been in a, a moment of time that they were just rock bottom and they couldn't do anything, and they cried out, God help me. God help us. God, I need you. If you're just crying out, it's not repentance. Repentance is a change of the heart. It is truly a turning away of, of the wrong direction and a, and a returning to God's direction. Grace, she got real good at crying out. <laughs> she knows what she's supposed to do. And, and, when, and when she's not done that, and and she thinks she's called, oh, Daddy, oh, good little Lord, Daddy, I'm sorry, I'm going to have a Daddy, I'm going to Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. You know, your parents, you've experienced it. There's no change there, is there? And, and truth be known, there's not a lot of compassion there either. Why? Because she can't fool me. She's pretty smart. But I've been around the block a time or two. As the old folk used to say when I was little, I didn't just crawl out from under a rock. But I can tell you when there's a change. And I can tell you when she just don't want trouble. Folks, I can tell you right now, as good as I am with my daughter in that relationship, there's a God above that knows exactly your heart. And he knows if you're just crying out because you think you've been caught or if you're crying out and truly trying to repent and change your sins. Pure religion is a practicing religion. Pure religion is a practical religion. Pure religion is a personal religion. And pure religion is pure religion. If there's anything in your life today that is not in line with this word, and this message that God has laid out, I encourage you to just follow your face before Him. Return to Him today. Don't just cry out, but truly repent and change your life. And let Him have a hold. James chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. If any man among you seems to be religious, for I was not in own tongue, but to see his own heart. This man's religion is in vain. Your religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this to visit the fatherless and the widows and their affliction and to keep himself, finish it with me, unspotted from the world. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father God, I thank you for the day. I thank you for all that you give us. Lord, I pray that you take this time of invitation. I pray that you work in our life. I pray that you let us do business with you. God, I pray that every word that that was uttered here today be received.
not as a word of judgment and condemnation from me or this church or anybody, but, but a word of, of truth that you are a loving God, that you are a loving Father, that you're willing to apply the blood of Calvary to all of our sins. And God, I pray that you let us not be doers of the word, nor hearers of the word only, but you let us be doers of the word. God, let us practically live out your life and what you called us to do before you. God, allow us to be personal in our religion, in the search. And God, allow us to be pure, to search our heart, to minister to others, to love those who are in a time of affliction. And God, just to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. If there be anybody here today that does not know you as their Savior, Lord, I pray that you let them use this time of invitation, that you draw them to you, that you let them know that today can be the day that they get to settle forever and ever. God, for the rest of us, just speak to our hearts and change our lives.